Okay, our final keynote address is from Soumya Mahadevan. Please put your hands together to welcome Soumya. Soumya Mahadevan is the co-founder and chief operating officer of Exeter Premedia Services, an e-publishing company which provides high technology services and media support solutions to leading professional and scholarly publishers across the world. Soumya completed her undergrad in ENC from Sri Venkateshwara College and received several accolades during her college years as well, Best Student Award, Outstanding Award, and lot, lots more. She then went on to do her Master's in Electrical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon on full research scholarship. After completion of her Master's, Soumya joined Tech Tools, a Dallas-based startup, and worked with them as a software engineer. And in 2006, she moved to India to establish an Indian office for tech tools. She started up the Chennai operations from scratch, including setting up the office, hiring the team, training them. And in 2010, tech tools was acquired by SolarWinds, an Austin, USA-based company. And with that acquisition came the opportunity for rapid expansion for the Indian subsidiary. Soumya successfully grew the Indian operation of SolarWinds from 20 to 120 employees. In 2016, she joined the Exeter Premedia Services as the COO, where she's currently spearheading the transition of the company from a traditional services company to a world-class SaaS publishing platform company. It's such a great introduction, Soumya. We are so happy to see you here, and over to you. It's wonderful to be here, and thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm the closing keynote speaker, so it falls on my head to keep up the energy and make you guys uh, not want to rush out the, uh, the door and get back home. So. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about agile delivery to deliver agility. So let's talk about the elephant in the room here, shall we? Agile means a lot of things to a lot of people. My background is I'm an entrepreneur. I've been you know, running businesses or pseudo businesses and so on to speak. Agile means a lot of things to a lot of people. And I think it's probably the most used, overused, abused word in the business context. If you don't have Agile in your presentation, your presentation doesn't count. So I had to put it in here, right? And uh, if you're making a business presentation, you better talk about business agility. What does Agile mean, right? So if you ask different people, different people will say different things. Just like the six blind men here who are coming up with various uh, impressions of what Agile means. You ask an engineer, they'll say, hey, you know, we have, we've got to do it in an Agile man, way, man. I mean, otherwise, good quality product and all won't come, okay? You, you have to do it in an agile way. An agile coach will say, yeah, you know, engage my services, otherwise product, your team is not having the right culture, you gotta get it all done. The finance guy sitting over there is saying, hello, give me a budget, yeah, how much money is actually going to, you, you guys are gonna need to finish up the project, right? And the, the guy on top is saying, okay, tell me when exactly the product is actually gonna come out. So agile means a lot of things to a lot of people. What exactly is agile? I think we spend a lot of time talking about what Agile is, but I think a, a good way of understanding what Agile is to look at what Agile is not. If you're doing the same thing over and over again, without learning from your experiences, without improving, you are not Agile. Very simple. Okay, so that's a very simplistic uh, view of uh, what agility means. So you can be very strong, but without agility, you're just mere mass. As a company, as a person, as an organization, as a team, what you want to be is like the elephant. This elephant, which, can, which is humongous, strong, but at the same time extremely agile. And it is capable of swimming, it is capable of running fast, it's capable of doing a lot of things. But let's get back to this. So why be agile? See, I'm a business owner, okay? I run a business. At the end of the day, why should I worry about being agile as a business? It's nice to have it as a good, uh, you know, the in thing to do and all that, but why really be agile? And I get the textbook definition. What does agile give you? Sure, you know, you're more, more adaptable, more flexible. You're not worried about change. These are all the, you know, the textbook things that you hear. You're not worried about change. Requirements can change during the, whatever, during the life cycle, it's not a big deal. You're not, you know, your team members may change, it's not a big deal. You're sort of tuned to deal with change. You're more adaptable, more flexible, so that's what agility gives you. You're more in sync with what the customers want because you're not in the traditional waterfall model. You built everything and then shipped it all the way at the end of that six month life cycle only to figure out it was not what the customer wanted. But here you're more in sync, right? That's what agility gives you, true. You're more predictable. You know, for that particular 
next feature, how many people would be required, what is the budget, etc. So you're a little bit more predictable about what exactly is required. Fair enough. You're able to provide a better quality output because quicker testing, faster, you know, more continuous testing, uh, more continuous validation of whether what we are putting in is actually what is required, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you are, you know, all of this is what agility is supposed to give you. You know, totally fair enough. I bite it. For me, I break down agility as it's a huge problem, but I can take it one step at a time. This can apply to a software, it can apply to business problem, it can apply to your life problem. What agility gives you is, it can be this really humongous burger, you are able to take it one bite at a time, most importantly, without getting a stomach upset. That's what agility gives you, right? It gives you that ability to break down problems step by step, see if you are headed the right direction and make course corrections along the way. Now, we want to be agile as organizations, as people, because we don't want to just survive. As, especially as an organization, we want to thrive. We want to grow, right? It's not just enough if we are in status quo. What was yesterday, we don't want, to want it to be like that, because that's the whole core concept of agility. There is this continuous improvement aspect that comes in. But at the center of all of this is your customer, right? If you're an organization, it's the customer of the organization. If you're a team member, it could be the person that you're interacting with, the person to whom you're delivering the product to, right? Your next step. So the core of all of this, of your survival, of your you know, thriving as a human being, exists the customer. You exist because the customer exists. You grow when your customer grows. And you thrive when your customer thrives. So that is a central theme that I feel should be brought back into all agility discussions. So how agile is my customer? Is that something that we think about? Is that th something that we uh, you know, pay a lot of attention to? A lot of agile conversations are around how, in what, how best, how agile, most agile can I be in delivering my product? Do we really pay attention to how agile is my customer? And in here, you know, replace customer with anybody. If you're an if you're in individual, you know, uh, your customer, or if you're a parent, your customer could be your child. Yeah. So just replace that word customer with whoever it is that you're dealing with. Do we think about how prepared for change is your customer? How are they tracking the changes that are coming their way? Right? Because most software development, you get the requirements. The customer tells you what they want. Who is looking at, are you paying attention to how adaptable you know, they are? This is a wonderful quote that I really like uh, by Wayne Gretzky, who is a famous Canadian ice hockey player. I skate to where the puck is going to be. That's how he became the great ice hockey player, not where it has been, right? So. Agility teaches us to skate to where your customer wants to go. But who is going to help the customer imagine where they need to go? Right? So can you be a change agent here? Can you actually wear that hat and say, hey, Mr. Customer, that's where you need to skate to? And become a partner in this whole conversation, right? So what does deliver agility really mean? You reimagine your value proposition. What are you giving to your customer? You empower your customers to delight their customers. So you're kind of preparing your customers to embrace and adapt change. Now, if you're all agility coaches, I mean, that's what you're doing. That's your business. So <laughs> that's not what I'm referring to here. But this is sort of like taking, embracing what changes your customers really are going through. There's this term, right, in SaaS business, customer lifetime, any business, customer lifetime value, because at the end of the day, a business exists. You need to get revenue. How much revenue are you able to get from your customer? How long are they your customer? That's the total customer lifetime value for the customer. Now, if you continuously keep evolving with them, giving them continuous value, your customer is going to stay with you for life. Revenue continues to go up. It looks like this. Customer lifetime value is infinity. Let me tell you a small story here. So we're back in 2004 when I know I first started my first business. 
we, uh, I moved back from the US and tried to recruit a few people and started our business and all that. And uh, we were in some small house in Mylapore, uh, you know, out of that shop. So I had a girl called Deepa who was given to me by the manpower agency. Her job was very simple. Sweep and mop the floors twice a day, right? Very important person in the office, huh, by the way. And uh, ensure that, you know, the office is locked and whatever, the basic, the janitorial services. It was given to me by the manpower agency. Now, prior to her coming on board, there were a bunch of other people who would come, do the basics, won't show up, etc. And this one was, uh, this one was very different. So she did this work for a few times and then she came up to me and said, ma'am, I see that there's a lot more work that you, you need a lot more help. Okay, you, uh, you know, what if I brought snacks for your employees? What if I did that? What if I did that, right? And over a period of time, she's, and, and I said, yeah, you know what, this sounds really good, Deepa, why don't you go for it? So she uh, quit that job, she started her own business. So from sweeping the floor, she went on to giving employees snacks. She would uh, take an initiative, you know, such initiatives like if it was raining outside, she would bring extra umbrellas for our employees. So much that, you know, she became such an integral part and, and being, having an office in a, in a house kind of a situation, you run into electrical issues, plumbing issues, water leakage issues, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. So where does that sort of an initiative come from, right? So it, this was not part of the mandate that I had given to her. So what ended up happening is, she was, it, and she was not just looking for opportunities. She started owning my business as her business. My growth as her growth, right? So what happens when you enter into that mindset is you're no longer talking about customer satisfaction. You're not even talking about customer delight. You've gone one step beyond. You're talking about customer ownership. It's almost like you've owned that particular customer and owned their success, right? I, for anything that I need today in my new business as well, I'll go to Deepa. And she's built a successful business of her own. And she grew her services because of this mentality that she had, right? I was talking to a bunch of my entrepreneur friends and we were talking about this and they said, you know, any entrepreneur thinks like this when you start off, what additional value can I give? How can I grow with my customers and et cetera? When you start hiring people, when you start growing the team, you sort of hit a roadblock. You've got to operationalize this mindset, right? Because the way an owner thinks about a business, it's very difficult to like percolate that sort of a mindset down to the team. So how do you take this mindset, which is what I'm calling as a deliver agility mindset, and move it, percolate it through the team? So the step number one is challenge your identity. Okay, I wanna, I wanna just present a short story here. I'm sure all of you have heard the Kodak story and quite familiar with it. So I won't spend too much time talking about it, but Kodak, this behemoth dealing with film and print, went out of business in 2012. And uh, the classic, the business, business case is used as a classic example of what happens if you don't embrace new technologies that come in, right? Fair enough, they, they did not, they failed to see that digital was on its way, they failed to change their business strategy and they went out of business. But my take on this is that actually the first digital camera was, uh, was uh, developed in, inside Kodak. I think all of you would have also heard that, right? So they did actually spend some money also in developing digital cameras. Even, so it was not even a case where they did not invest money. They invested some money into it. They also bought this Ophoto, photo sharing platform. So they could have become the Instagram, right? So they also, they also were able to see that, okay, digital photo sharing is coming along. They saw that wind of change, they actually invested, acquired this business, so then what happened? So when they had taken all these strategic steps, yet Kodak went bust, so what happened? What happened here is that they never were able to change their mindset or their identity from being a film and print company. So they saw all of these new acquisitions as a way to sell more print. So as I said, okay, oh, photo is a way in which you can take and print more of your photographs. That was what they were pushing, not digital sharing. So even though it was like a half-hearted attempt into going to digital, so what they were not able to give up was their identity, right? So my ask to all of you is challenge your identity. What do you identify with? You know, are you identifying yourself as a developer, a business analyst, this, that? Are you identifying yourself as an organization that delivers product X, Y, Z? Or are you behind a bigger vision and a mission? 
right? All organizations have a bigger vision and mission that's usually printed, hung, laminated. But do you really live that? Is the, is the first challenge that I'd like to throw at you. Number two is trust is a, is a word that gets thrown around whenever you talk about agile transformations, right? So trust is a very, very integral part of uh, Agile, I think when we were talking earlier as well, how do I trust that my team is actually doing the right thing? How do I trust that my team members are actually spending eight hours a day, okay? So how do you lead, and, and especially if you are wanting, and uh, earlier when I was talking about you deliver agility to your customer, you cannot do this unless you establish a level of trust with them. Who are you to go and tell them how to change if you don't have that transformation within yourself? This is a very interesting equation that was that is there in the book called uh, Speed of Trust. It talks about when trust is low, speed is low, and cost is high. Very practical example. If you don't trust that your team members are doing what they are supposed to do, you'll follow up with them five times a day. Get on a call, show me evidence, do this, do that, etc., etc. All of that is equal to cost. Fair enough? When trust is high, speed is high, and cost is low. Consequently, right? So if you really trust that somebody is able to deliver, you really trust that something is going to happen, you don't have to do so much follow-up, so much layering on top, et cetera, et cetera, things get done, right? The same equation is what we have to establish with our customer. That sort, that level of a trust equation. Now, this is a very interesting, so we talked about trust, but I want to really break down trust because I think it's, a, it's again, a very abstract term that gets thrown around a lot, just like culture, just like agile. So a lot of these are very abstract terms, but you have to break it down into really, into its components. Trust has two components, character and competence. This is where things come from. Character has integrity and intent. What does that mean? I trust a person because I think he's honest, right? I trust him because I know that he's going to do the right thing. So there is intent and there is Honestly, that falls under the character side. Competence, I know that he's got the skills required to do the work. And number two, I know that he is going to use the skills to be able to deliver the results, right? So these are the verbs below. So when there is a lack of trust, it could be because of one of the other. You, can, you may not trust a something or somebody or some organization or whatever because of a lack of the character side or because of a lack on the competence side. It is very important to distinguish what it is, right? You, a very high trust on the character side, but with still with a very low competence, is usually the dangerous one that don't, doesn't come bubble up. Because you really like the person, I, I really think he's very honest. He's trying really hard, let me you know, stay with it for much longer. That's the one that usually gets missed out. Now how does this translate into an organization? Say, I was talking about earlier about how do you help your customers transform. If I want to help my customers transform, fundamentally, do they trust me? This is a very important question. Across all your organization, across all the touch points that you have with your customer, do your you know, people do what they say you know, and do meet their word? And do they deliver high quality uh, you know, output to the, to the customers? That's a very, very important thing. So establishing trust is a very key component of agility. Now, when you have established, when you have gone into that level of trust, you become a part of your customer. You become a partner. I mean, a, uh, the vendor, partner, all of these are, again, terms that are used, but you really become an integral part of your customer, so much that they are also now invested in your growth. So just to share an example, uh, you know, a few years back, one of our largest customers, we were running it on some scalability problems with them, so we, one of the projects was on red. Had a lot of issues, everybody in the office was on it and trying our level best, et cetera. Now the level of trust, because of all the past projects we had executed with them, the leadership called me and said, uh, you know, Saumya, you've helped us save a lot of money. And that came because we had constantly been delivering projects and things to save them money. Said, we've already saved us a lot of money, I have extra budget left aside, can I give you, can I allocate more money to this particular project if you want to, you know, if that's going to help you turn it green. We didn't take the additional money, but I thought that was like a great level of trust that the customer had. They didn't come to us and say, I'm going to pull out this project, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. They were willing to co-solve that problem along with us. They were willing to cooperate and solve that problem along with us. 
Step number three is widen your scope, right? What are you actually um, uh, looking for? Look left, look right, above, below, you know, what exactly are you looking at, right? And, and here, I think AWS is a great example, again, and Amazon started off as an e-commerce company. Now, you know, they have, AWS is the most uh, profitable wing of theirs, and it's really transformed their company. So as if you're not willing to look left, right, up and down, you know, you're again stuck in the same spot. So it's very important for you to embrace agility. Who are now an agile partner, I'm assuming all of us have already learned how to become, become agile. Start delivering agile products and agile services to your customer. You make the transition to becoming an agility partner right now because you're helping your customers become more agile through, and this becomes a very symbiotic relationship that's going on over here. You are delivering agility, you're co-creating solutions with your customer, and your customer is now transformed into becoming an agile customer. Let's talk a little bit about scaling culture, because I think culture is the other abstract word that gets thrown around. Uh, in my mind, I think you know, culture is, is this amorphous cloud that's out there. You have to break it down into something that I can, something that's tangible. But everybody who talks about culture says, oh, this is the way we do things. This is, this is my culture. This is, but really, what is it? Okay, so that's a very abstract concept that I feel like has to really be broken down. If you want to continue to deliver agility to your customers and continue to grow and continue to evolve with them. So there is this concept called freedom within a framework. I don't know how much of you, how many of you have heard that. But in Agile, we talk a lot about the teams making the decisions and being freed of, you know, thinking and, and, and self, um, you know, collaborating and, and self-organizing uh, teams and all of that. But there needs a framework around that, right? Because without the framework, the freedom is just chaos. There has to be a framework around it. And especially in an Indian context. And the reason I'll tell you why is, is it's very interesting because our schooling system, the way we have been brought up, is all around frameworks. Do you agree? I'll give you an example. I have two sons. My older son goes to a CBSE school. My younger son goes to a Montessori school. My older son, if I tell him to study from, uh, you know, he's got an exam from page number nine to page number 25. If I ask him a question from page number 26, he'll tell, Amma, that is not part of the portions. Do not ask me that question. So very nicely boxed, only nine to 24 for the exam. My younger son from a Montessori environment is much more, play he has, doesn't even have a textbook. He's much more you know, free and uh, I don't know what he does, but he's supposed to do something. Okay, but, but, but you get my point. We are all, we've all grown up most of the time with societal norms, educational norms. There is a framework that has been put around us. So I think maybe it's our culture. We need that framework around us. And the framework consists of the values that you are operating within, the governance aspect. We earlier talked about what is this rules within rules of engagement that the team wants to do, wants to engage in. Very important to keep that. You need to be guided by the strategy. You can't do something that's completely orthogonal to the strategy of the company. And then you need to have materiality. What does materiality mean? And what are the risks that you're taking that could derail the whole plan? You need to know what is the risk taking that is happening. So it's very important to have freedom to operate. It's very important to discuss the framework around that freedom, and you can only operate within that. Now, I think what we need to have is what are called as culture scrums. You have to keep coming back to this, visiting this, and saying, is this box enough? Can I expand it a little bit? And you need to engage the team in discussions around culture with all of these four things coming in, and then we keep redefining that box, right? Now, we usually do that only when we run into a problem where we say, oh, you know, something didn't work. Let's go back and see what. But it is very important to have a mindset of thinking, okay, what is working and can we keep improving the way we work in doing culture sprints or culture scrums and actually having active conversations around it. So now, with, with all of this background that we have put in, all of this hard work that has gone into evolving ourselves, you end up with what I am calling as a deliver agility loop, where you are now an agility partner, your customer has now transformed into an agile customer, who's delivering 
continuous value to his customer. But this is a holistic loop right now, right? Because you are increasingly, you're, you're delivering increasing agility through your agile products and agile services and, and other agile conversations that you're having with your customer. You've just become a partner right now. And you are helping your customer deliver increasing value to their customer, feedback, and you're always keeping your customer's customer in your vicinity, in your uh, you know, viewfinder, and you're always looking at that. And it becomes an infinite loop. You are a partner for life. You grow, you evolve. And I love this image because I feel like this really you know, shows what I'm talking about and what the concept that I wanted to get out is if you are drawing your customer's journey, if you're interested in, in you know, making sure that they are successful, they in turn will make sure that you are successful. They are crafting your success story. So this becomes this amazing loop that continues forever. And while I'm presenting this in the context of an organization, you can take this in the context of any relationship. Perhaps today when you go back home, talk to your spouse and talk about how you can make her or him be more successful. In turn, they will make sure that they, you, you, are, you become successful. All right, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you for breaking down the concepts of agility, trust, culture, and introducing us to some amazing frameworks around freedom to operate, ideas about agility partner, customer ownership. I think that was an amazing keynote speech. So thank you for the closing keynote and amazing day one. Uh, we would like to actually give you a token of gratitude. Uh, I request Srijit to please uh, come and hand over the uh, certificate. I think that's an amazing background to have this picture. <laughs>